thanks everyone for joining us for the webinar behind the scenes of product innovation at Rolling Stone. At WordPress VIP, our customers are constantly innovating with their websites and we see them pushing WordPress beyond just the blog. So along with our partner, XWP, we invited Penske Media Corporation to show us under the hood of how product innovation happens for their digital products like Rolling Stone. Um, as we go on with the session, please use the Q&A box to ask your questions. We'll have some time at the end to answer them. Um, I'll let Alison Blander from the WordPress VIP team take it from here. Over to you, Alison. Thank you, Tess. Hi, everybody. And welcome to our panel discussion, um, specifically about the behind the scenes partnerships that help drive product innovations at Rolling Stone. I'm Allison Blanda. I manage uh, strategic relationships here at WordPress VIP, and I'll be uh, your moderator today. As the host, I am absolutely the least important person here. So I'm gonna get right out of the way and jump in and ask Nikki Catton from uh, Penske Media Corp, Leo of XWP and Liz of WordPress VIP, uh, who you see here with us, um, to start by introducing themselves. Uh, Nikki, I'll ask you to go first. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nikki Catton. I'm the Vice President of Product Delivery at Penske Media Corporation with the parent company of Rolling Stone and uh, actually over 20 other brands as well. So I oversee product and project management at PMC. Um, there's quite a few aspects to that role, but I think a couple of them are particularly pertinent for what we're going to kind of discuss today. And that includes organizing um, our roadmap and our resource planning, ensuring that we're delivering a fair amount to each of our different brands and making sure that we're doing the right thing at the right time, or at least trying to anyway. Um, I also project managed the replatform and redesign of rollingstone.com a couple of years ago. And my teams have been heavily involved in continuing to innovate and work on rollingstone.com uh, since then, driven by a number of different business areas. So I'm really excited to, to dig into this today. Fabulous. Leo, you're up next. Hey everyone, my name is Leo Postavoid. Uh, I'm the Head of Product Strategy and Partnerships at XWP. Um, we work with technology companies and publishers like PMC and all of their brands to uh, make whatever they want happen. So uh, our big thing is pointing our nose in the right direction to the future. We work to be your strategic trusted advisor over the long term to really be able to do what you want uh, all the way through. Uh, the other cool thing about what we tend to do, because we're a gold uh, agency uh, for WordPress VIP, is we really ask the questions of what do you want to scale with? Uh, how do you want to scale? How will you get there? And uh, with PMC, it's been really great to see how their brands have evolved over the years. And I'm really excited to dig in today to tell you all a little bit more about how we do that. Oh, you would. Yeah. All right. Great. <laughs> Hi, I'm a lead technical account manager at WordPress VIP, and I work on a squad uh, that manages high value media customers like PMC. And our squad ensures that applications like PMCs uh, run WordPress at scale. And this includes everything from architectural consulting uh, to performance reviews to, uh, reviews to discussions about engineering best practices. Um, and my favorite part of my job is working with future partners and uh, customers because future partners know our platform so well and they really help customers leverage WordPress. Uh, and I also have the uh, honor of being the technical account manager working on the initial Word, uh, Rolling Stone migration as well. Amazing. So I want to kick us off with a kind of level setting question because Nikki, you mentioned that PMC has more than 20 brands when you have your team has multiple projects in flight, internal teams to manage, and then a whole partner ecosystem two of which are here right now. So how do you decide whether to partner with a third party or take a project in house? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a lot to that actually. So I think I'll start just a little bit talking about the structure, how we kind of operate as a whole. Um, you know, we have similar challenges to, to a lot of enterprise companies in the sense that we get a huge volume of uh, requests from, from a variety of different people, you know, from all our different brands, but also within the brands as well. You know, there are requests coming in from editorial, from marketing, from sales, from events, from design. And these can be very, very small tweaks all the way up to huge multi-year projects. 
And so in order to, to make sure that we can be both proactive and reactive with what we're working on, um, we actually kind of really try to ring fence our resource. So one of the first things that we do is we have um, actually quite a formal definition of what a project is for work in our, in our team. Um, and that's not just your typical kind of like it has a start date and an end date. There's quite a few criteria uh, that are involved in that, including, you know, multi sprint, multi brand, revenue generating, exec visibility um, and a combination of these things generally results in us kind of saying this is large enough to be a project in the truest sense in that it needs uh, more oversight, more governance, more reporting, more communication, all those kind of things. And when we have a project come into the team, um, that is something that has to be roadmap and it has to be resourced accordingly. And part of that resourcing conversation and decision making is, do we want to do this in house or do we want to outsource it? So the rest of our work is, is kind of similar to what Liz was saying, actually, in terms of the squads. We have pods uh, who, who kind of handle the, uh, the, the more day to day requests and, and work kind of gets funneled to those. But when a project comes in and it's defined as such, we sit down and we look at the project, we look at our roadmap, um, we see what else we've got kind of lined up and going on at the moment. And we actually look at what we're trying to deliver with that project as well. And if it's something that is something that we are going to uh, be responsible for uh, maintaining, developing, rolling out to other brands, that's generally something that we want to be pretty hands on on, if, if not leading entirely. Um, and if it's something that is kind of like, you know, in the most simple case, a one and done, so maybe like a sales site or something like that, that's, that's a one off. We know we're not going to necessarily need to touch it significantly in the future. So we're kind of okay saying we can outsource this. And then there's obviously everything kind of in between. And what we, uh, what we actually do is when we do outsource or when we do partner is we always ensure that we have a technical lead from our side as well. So someone that is responsible for both technical architectural decisions, um, but also uh, for code reviews making, I mean, obviously we've got a huge, you know, very solid code review process with WordPress VIP, but also making sure that we're using kind of our core technology and our kind of, you know, real, real the, the foundational work that we are doing in our code as well. Um, and we have a product uh, and or a project manager, depending on the delivery as well. So we kind of, we have a look at our roadmap, what the thing is that we're delivering, what we're going to need to do in the future. And then we kind of take a call on there if we want to outsource and to what extent. And I'll definitely kind of just finish on saying that things that are like a, you know, a full re-platform, you know, that involves a lot of content migration, that's normally something that we want to pull someone in, in to help us with, just because to be completely frank, we want to use our internal resources on things like that, on innovating and developing things that we are going to be rolling out to our brands and not necessarily things that are, you know, task driven that we're not going to need to do again in the future. Leo, how does work, how does XWP approach working with the product setup like the one he described? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the fun part is, you know, as much as PMC will uh, say we want to own everything, we want to own the product vision, own the strategy for these things, and they definitely do own the vast majority of it. What ends up happening is our engineers are just as motivated to innovate and find ways to grow within that. So. Um, for Rolling Stone, I, I still remember quite vividly, you know, we spent a lot of time tooling up uh, some pretty cool advanced front end tools and tools and techniques. Um, the actual migration, for example, uh, had a really, really complicated set of elements from uh, some legacy data that was part of a Postgres SQL uh, tool. So we used um, Google App Engine, uh, uh, Google, Google Cloud's App Engine to help pull a lot of that data over. So in that migration method, uh, we basically thought really hard about how we were going to do that, how to do it reliably, how to do it quickly. Um, and I know Nikki has referred to it as a silky smooth launch, just a nice fun phrase we get to talk about. But you know, we we basically seek out every opportunity to push ourselves further. Um, and you know, we don't really uh, like we're not. We're not a line cook, if you will. We would do our best to also show up to the table and deliver just as high value uh, wherever possible. And I have to say, the one great thing about PMC and many of the organizations we work with is they are very receptive to ideas. So um, one of the big parts, as we see with processes, so PMC has their own internal design resources. Um, as we work with them, they had lots of ideas and lots of big pieces. There was a lot of back and forth, and that's very normal for us to expect how these things are working. So if you have a component that's extremely complicated and it adds lots of overhead, we might say there might be a quicker way to get there, or there might be a better way to do this. And they might say, no, this is the reason why we thought through this, and we'll work with you to figure out exactly what that looks like. 
Um, the, the big part I would say is when you choose a partner, whether it's WordPress VIP or XWP or anyone else in the ecosystem, you should be asking some of the more basic questions, which is, are they going to show up and actually challenge these ideas? Are they going to push us to think this completely through? Um, and realistically, we found that working together with PMC, we've been able to shape a really solid uh, set of products out. Um, and every single time we think about what we're building, we're ultimately trying to ship something that feels really solid. So um, at the end of the day, I'd be asking, like, how do you find a partner who's going to help you on that journey and not just say, yes, yes, yes. And sometimes you say no, or maybe, or how do we do this in the best way? Or how do we deliver this small first and then iterate toward a bigger piece? Um, and that's generally what we try to do is agile delivery with you know, innovation in mind. Great. Uh, a big part, uh, a big part of uh, all of these, these three teams ethos is open source. And I know that all three of you take that really seriously. Uh, and part of open source is, is, admit, is admitting that um, everyone around you is probably trying to say, solve the same problem as you and reinventing the wheel isn't, shouldn't be necessary. So I'm curious how that mentality informs the way the three of you work together. Uh, let's start again with Nikki. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that is a huge ethos for us on so many levels, not just in terms of of WordPress, just in terms of our own internal development as well, you know, multi-brand, we can't reinvent the wheel every time, we would literally never get anything done or anything of value done, um, and that is a huge kind of, uh, you know, kind of um, backbone of our core technology uh, aspect as well, which I think we can touch on a little bit later, but in terms of how we work together, I mean, Liz knows our team are consistently raising tickets with WordPress VIP and saying, hi, we've got a thing. We've got a challenge. Has anyone done this before? What have you tried? What do you recommend? Um, you know, when we have to operate that way. I mean, we would not be as successful as we are if we didn't have, you know, these these resources, this open source ethos and mentality. Um, and just, you know, everyone in the team very open to that as well. We can't be masters at everything. We don't want to be masters at everything. We're a lean team and we have to figure out what we want to specialize in. And the resources are out there. We need to rely on it. Similarly with XWP, I mean, what Leo was just saying, that partnership and that back and forth and those conversations are absolutely critical to everything that we develop with anyone that we work with and it is about respect and understanding and just trying to get to the best solution in the most efficient way. Liz, that being said, where are you sitting in that ecosystem and how, do, how does you, how do you impact that? Well, I wouldn't say that we impact WordPress core or like as an open source, but we are highly involved and engaged and motivated to think about how core changes impact our customers. And um, it's really great when our customers are also involved in the evolution of WordPress core. So uh, Petsky Media Corporation has a number of, of engineers who are really active in that community. And it's great to engage with them in in that open source project and also be able to think about how that impacts um, how that impacts you know the Penske Media Corporation but also all of our other clients at VIP and just to like echo what Nikki said like we absolutely cannot wait for tickets to come in and say hey we're thinking about this long-term project six to twelve months out can you tell us how other customers might be um, tackling this this business problem um, and it really helps us also kind of think about where our roadmap overlaps and how we can all just kind of make make sure that we're making the best use of everyone's time go open source <laughs> Leo, how does open source and building blocks inform how your uh, team approaches work specifically with Rolling Stone? Yeah, so um, I, I want to answer the question a little bit differently. So go come with me on the journey. Um, I absolutely love the open source work that I've actually seen VIP and PMC do as well. Um, and it actually informs some of us and it's a great interplay and, I, and it does come back to Rolling Stone. So uh, one of the cool things we did on another project for PMC just recently um, on Variety, we used uh, the Larva design system framework. So and that's open source that's available on the PMC repos. Um, I have to say watching VIP open source its tools over the last, you know, I think 10, 15 years at this point uh, has been incredible to see um, between the news project between all of the work with all the editorial tools between the amp plugin which we eventually took over as xwp and google eventually took over and has been opening it and maintaining it in the wild um, a lot of that informs how we look at the ecosystem um, i'm also a component maintainer for privacy um, core is a really really big deal to xwp and we really think about what these things are going to be structured um, we contribute quite a bit of time toward uh toward wordpress in the wild um, we have a big program internally called wordpress plus where we actually pay our engineers to work if they choose to on a given section within that 
Um, as it relates to PNC directly, you know, obviously we use some of the tools that are built inside the WordPress VIP that are open sourced. Um, they, there's obviously the AMP plugin um, on basically every one of the PNC sites. Um, we obviously have built in certain aspects of core and functions that we really think are critical for making sure you actually leverage that WordPress experience. Um, one of the big things we talk about in the wild uh, is trying to do things the WordPress way. And so what that means is even though it may not necessarily be WordPress core per se, even as we build out new features or build out new extensions or we think about filters and functions and coding standards and even uh, philosophies and approaches, we're asking, is this right? Is this what another WordPress agency would do? Is this what another organization would do? Is this what would happen if core did this? Um, we're trying to understand like, how does this look as a, as a fuller landscape? So another part of the sort of open source core ethos is trying to make sure that this will work um, not only at an enterprise scale or at an individual scale, but across the you know, 200 million websites that run WordPress in the wild. Got it, got it. And bringing it back to specifically the Rolling Stone uh, product journey, uh, Nikki, I did want to congratulate your team on launching the new digital subscription model last week. Congratulations. I know that was a big project for everyone on this call. Uh, I'm curious how you're measuring success uh, and then I'd love to hear from Leo and Liz on how your teams are contributing to those metrics as part of this ecosystem. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think success is a very interesting, measuring success is a very interesting thing to think about because naturally your brain goes to, you know, almost the very standard success metrics, right? So you're looking at traffic, or engagement, revenue, all those kind of things. And those are foundational to us. I mean, we, we can't continue developing if we're not meeting those goals. But one of the things that I think is actually quite interesting is a slightly different angle is looking at two other areas as well. So there's not just around the actual performance of, of, the, of the digital products and, and how they're doing in terms of, of numbers and dollars and, and speed and all those kind of things, but also thinking a little bit about um, you know, things like editorial success as well. Do our editorial teams feel like they're being supported? Do they feel like they've got a good product? Do they feel like they're getting developments that they need from us to, to ensure that their publishing tools are as good as they can be? And I think this is particularly important for a brand like Rolling Stone. You know, they're iconic and they, they need the tools that, to enable them to showcase their award-winning journalism and photography. And, and I think that is something that we are consistently trying to balance up. You know, we're, we're constantly trying to balance up the, the, the things that are driving success for a business and the things that are driving success for a business in terms of how they can actually get things out to their audience and in what ways they can do that. And that's, a, to be honest, that's a really big challenge. That is something that you know, we struggle with day in, day out, and we're still trying to figure out. And we, we are constantly tweaking and changing things and figuring out, you know, what's our, our best mix of working on, on, on these kind of things. And, and that kind of leads me to my, my third area of success, which is very personal to me, but also to my team as well, which is our delivery success, our product success. Are we delivering things that are adding value to our businesses and not just the things they're asking for? You know, are we delivering things that are, being requested for from some of our, you know, more corporate teams like SEO, audience development, revenue and operations, product, us ourselves, things that we want to be out there trying, engineering so that we can improve our code base, so that we can roll out things like our Lava design system, which is revolutionary for us. And are we doing it on time? And are we getting things out quick enough? And are we, are we pivoting quick enough as well? If something, if something doesn't, it doesn't perform as expected. And so I think, you know, when we talk about success metrics, it's very easy to just go, are we making money? Is our traffic up? You know, are our page views up? And actually what I like to think about a little bit more is, is kind of the other side of it as well. And, and, and that really feeds into a lot of our kind of road mapping and resourcing and business planning as well. So it's not really a direct answer to your question about our, our metrics, but kind of like broadening it out a little bit. I want to know, I want to know like, page views <laughs> and subscriber data. You're not gonna <laughs> I might uh might not have my job if I uh, it's only been a week. Yeah. It's only been a week. Okay. <laughs> Well, I would just, I, I would love to just hop in and just say like one of the things that is great about um, just working with PMC is also when things don't go well as expected, um, you know, Nikki had said like sometimes, you know, you just need to be able to pivot and having that close relationship with uh, Penske Media Corporation means that we know where, um, where things stand in their, in their roadmap and in their sense of priority. So like if something doesn't go right, we're able to just kind of say, great, we know like this, you know, looking at this is really important. And, 
I mean, we're, we're really like, we're, we're just trying to be really deeply embedded in everything that uh, Petsky Media Corporation does in terms of understanding, you know, the roadmap and their individual uh, project metrics as well. Yeah, I, I know one of the big things that Nikki and I have spent a lot of time talking about and, and seeing it be improved in the process uh, across the PMC network is also, as she mentioned, around time to publish, uh, around editorial workflow experiences. Um, one of the big things that you'll see on a lot of the PMC sites are list articles, uh, listicles, if you will. Um, and a lot of these require structured content. A lot, a lot of that might actually inform structured data in terms of SEO. Um, and even with these larger, longer form editorial pieces, how we tell those stories with design and with content in, in mind, a lot of that is possible because WordPress is a super dynamic platform. Um, another big thing that we see as a key metric, uh, and you can see this tracked across all, all sites on the internet really, is performance. Um, and that's a big thing that we do at XWP. We really do want to make sure that sites are fast, that they're reliable, that they're viewable in every country and every part of the world. Uh, we want to make sure that they make sense on mobile devices. Um, so a big thing that I'd be trying to point people toward if they're looking to innovate their product is, is it easy to use for the editorial team? Is it easy to use for the audiences that come to it? Is it actually viewable? Um, I was looking at one publisher site just a couple days ago, and I was shocked because the amount of ads that were on the site, there was this autoplay video thing at the top, there was a sticky thing at the bottom, there was a pop-up ad that sat on top of things, and there was also an email newsletter. And then because I'm in California, there was a little GDPR notice, that, or sorry, a CCPA notice that said, hey, let's make this happen. And I'm like, well, your users need to make sure that they prioritize uh, you need to prioritize your users in terms of what they see in terms of engaging that experience. Um, and one of my favorite things about the Rolling Stone site is that it's uh, really been designed with users in mind. It's really easy to read content. It's really easy to immerse yourself. It's really easy to get from one article to the next. Um, and a lot of that is because WordPress was configured in a way that allows you to go on that user journey uh, in a pretty solid way. Great, and we're getting a lot of questions about kind of subscriptions and subscription management. So to kind of, um, summarize them or you are to Leo and Nikki can you kind of summarize what the workflow uh, you follow for subscription management is sure I can talk a little bit about that so this has a huge, been a huge area of investment for us as a company as a whole over the last couple of years so we have historically had sites that have had a, a harder paywall and subscription management aspect and also print you know print subscription is, is has been a huge part of a lot of our businesses for for decades uh, and we've actually over the last couple of years completely redeveloped our subscription technology stack um, so we're using a combination of a different of different systems right now including um, Zora um, um, Salesforce and uh, Auth0 for authentication as well. And we've actually invested a lot of time working with, with, you know, alongside other partners, including XWP and also working with WordPress VIP to make sure things tie together on coming up with our own middleware and our own kind of technology stack that really um, basically takes the best of these different systems and allows us to have more of a seamless end-to-end -end subscriber or new registrant experience. I think one of the things that we've uncovered, um, and we uncover this with a lot of things, and I think this is, you know, it's gonna sound really obvious, but I think it's important to say, with a lot of new technologies, there is nothing out there that does it all. There with a lot of new technologies, you have to do a lot of taking things and thinking, okay, this does this really well, and this does this really well. What do we need to do to make these things integrate in the best possible way that allows our users to, to basically have a seamless experience without knowing that they're jumping from system to system. So it's something that we um, originally worked on for a considerable amount of time and, and kind of completely redid our, redid our subscriber management system as well, um, rolled it out onto Women's Wear Daily. We rolled it out onto Variety earlier this year with a new kind of um, more premium product. So Variety.com is not, doesn't have a paywall on it, but Variety VIP, which is a, a kind of like a thought leadership um, more premium products does have a digital subscription aspect and as we mentioned earlier we, we've launched on Rolling Stone last week with what we're calling a permeable paywall so it's 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 still quite light um, but it's something that you know users will be increasingly seeing or as they start to get into more thought leadership content they'll be coming up against as well and to be completely honest it's something that we're going to be continuing to develop and improve you know it's, it's a huge part of our technology stack alongside the publishing stack now um, over the next few years I would say at least 
Yeah, I, I should say, uh, Nikki and our team spent a lot of time working together on Variety VIP Plus. Uh, super interesting, uh, very uh, curious to see uh, how that all timed up. So uh, it's quite interesting to watch. Um, if you read DigiDay or any of the larger publications that talk around pub the publishing industry, you'll see that subscriber numbers are basically increasing across the board for most publishers. Um, and a big thing to consider is as you want to dive into this alternate monetization model, um, we've seen that depending on what vertical you're in, like. Some of your revenue increase has gone up, some of it's gone down, some of your traffic's gone up, some of it's gone down. Um, generally speaking, we're seeing that most sites are experiencing a positive increase, especially the ones that have thought about performance. Um, and those who are really asking of their audience uh, that they want to do something uh, with quality content in mind means focusing on subscriptions as a key model. Um, so my favorite part about the, the Variety VIP experience is that it's all about creating a quality content experience. Um, as this rolls out to Rolling Stone and to the other verticals uh, that PMC touches, um, I think that's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, as we start to tackle more premium content, as people are going to be wanting to engage with these longer, more engaging pieces, um, having content in a separate garden, a walled garden, if you will, will allow users to want to engage deeper in these spaces. Um, that being said, I think there is a, a great conversation around the open web and sort of keeping people to remember that subscriptions aren't the only way to handle things. Um, I read a really great article this morning talking about how uh, subscriptions aren't uh, the only way to handle things. Sometimes if you just run lots of ads and you sell people like if you use a subscription model to have no ads or uh, one of my good friends in college came up with the idea of a nag wall where used to have a narwhal pop up on the page to remind you hey can you please donate money like it doesn't always have to be a subscription model uh, per se you can encourage people to do uh, a variety of different ways to monetize uh, and of course there's the public model where people use like an NPR or PBS where you have uh, a sort of donor based system um, what, depending on which type of publisher you are or where you are in the, in the world of things, it makes sense to consider as many monetization models, but subscriptions, I would say today is the sort of most obvious bit. Um, and I would say PMC is a leader in, in around the, the, the methodologies in which those things are being structured, constructed. Yeah, I actually so just want to jump in on that, actually. Sorry, that's, that's a, it's a really good point. Like, I firmly, you know, believe that not every single brand in the world is suitable for having a subscription model. Um, you know, not every single brand in the PMC universe is, is suitable for it, because a lot of it depends on your audience. You know, and I, I do believe that if you are going to go down a digital subscription model, you need to be offering content that is unique and is worth paying for, not offering content that you can Google and get elsewhere. And I think that is going to be a really difficult model for the whole industry to kind of, you know, figure out. And I've already seen some companies starting to go too far down that route. And, and, and why would I pay to, to see something I can get a news alert for, essentially? So that's a really good point, maybe. And I, I think that's the my favorite part about Rolling Stone in terms of a content universe is it isn't pulling sources from you know traditional wire services, if you will. It's not just using old articles from 20 years ago. You can read some of that stuff. The archives are there, but there's fresh, there's current, there's relevant pieces. Um, and so if you're building a brand, if you're thinking about what your value is to the community, if you're thinking about your users, they want things that are original, that are high quality, that are relevant, that are curated. Um, and that's, that's the ethos that I think Rolling Stone tries to portray, um, in addition to extremely high quality journalism. I've been reading Rolling Stone since I was in, I think, middle school. Uh, so it's a brand that I personally associate with. Um, and of course, I think there's uh, there is a really important part that if you're going to be a subscriber, you're saying, I choose to support this because it's worth my time and it's worth the content in terms of what I want to do and what, what I do and, and how I want to read that. And if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, there were kind of three versions or two versions of the digital subscription model that you've worked through, whether it was WWD or then Variety VIP, and now, as of last week, uh, a version on Rolling Stone, it kind of brings to mind the idea of, okay, how do you factor in experimentation when you're working with a brand that has a legacy, uh, but then you also want to innovate? That's for all three of you. That's uh that's a challenge <laughs> you know it's there's there is uh there's always a risk that you put something new out on a on an iconic brand or a, or a brand that people are paying for as well you know and and things fail things need to fail so that you can make them better so i think the the kind of approach that we do is we do a lot of experimentation we normally we pick a brand it might not be some, one of our biggest brands to begin with we might start on a on a on a different brand um or might start on a, a smaller section of a site as well you don't have to do everything across the whole site to begin with and then we follow you know the standard model we, we experiment we analyze we iterate if needed we roll out we roll out to a certain 
certain extent. You know, we don't necessarily roll out everything everywhere. Um, I think a lot of our sites follow, you know, a pretty solid 80-20 rule where 80% of, of the, the, the site is based on, a, on some form of our standards code base or our standard kind of wireframes and then there's 20 percent of localization and and we're always evaluating that when we do we do roll out experiments as well we don't just put something on the site because for the sake of it um but it is and it is something that you know we're, we're careful about you know and it's the balance between being careful and being innovative and being dynamic and, and trying things but we just we just really assess the landscape and we speak to our stakeholders as well we see what comfort level is out there in the business and, and out in the wild as well yeah, I, I should say the the idea of Cortec uh, is a really important one as well. So uh, w whether it's PNC or some of the other larger brands we've worked with in the past uh, uh, and, and present, I should say as well, uh, whether it's News Corp or Interactive One or Heavy, some of these bigger brands all share this idea of a single code base that makes sense in the wild. So there is localization that occurs in these individual sites. Um, but having a single code base means it's really easy to roll out new features across the board. It's really easy to maintain things. When you have a bug, it sometimes gets spread across the entire ecosystem of things, but it's also really good to be able to, um, to ultimately have these things come back together and, and not have to worry about all these sites in the wild. You can find one thing and make it more modular. Uh, and, and also I'd say the other big thing around core tech is that as you develop once, you don't necessarily need to worry about um, any tests that might break, you don't necessarily need to worry about any SEO concerns. You can say confidently, I did this thing once and it works everywhere else. Um, I also think that PNC has done a really good job of thinking about every individual brand. So that 20%, it sounds like it's a low effort, but there actually is a lot of focus and a lot of energy put to the individualization, individualization and the voices of those brands. Um, and I think that's that's the smartest thing if you can do. If, you've, if you're a publisher with a portfolio of brands or if you're thinking about you know, your uh, number of sites and even how they're all different, there's probably a lot that can be overlapping and shared and trying to go down the pathway of uh, whether it's a multi-site universe that you're building out, whether it's uh, individual uh, plugins and themes that are being used across the board, trying to create something that is repeatable is going to be really useful. Vicky, I think one of the things that would be really interesting um, is that people might be might want to know what the timeline looked like for, um, you know, for the solution. Like, when did you start? How long did you explore? Like, from the exploration period to the time you started engineering, can you approximate how long that was? I think about early conversations we had had eons ago. I mean, that's what it feels like as eons. Um, but it might be nice to know kind of what like that project timeline looked like, just so that people understand, you know, these are, um, these decisions kind of follow a very long term roadmap. Are you talking about the digital subscription model there? Yeah. Yeah. So I think from the from the initial exploration of us kind of going, we need to upgrade what we, we currently have to the full um, migration of subscribers and launch of, of, of the kind of ecosystem working together was, I think, 12 to 18 months for Women's Wear Daily. Um, I mean, I would say similarly to when we were doing website launches on, on WordPress VIP, you know, years and eons ago, literally years ago, you know, the whole idea is that we get faster. Um, and again, that, that, you know, really does relate to this idea of working smartly. Don't change it every time, change the 20%, put your effort into changing that 20%, which means, you know, the, the Rolling Stone digital subscription model, aside from the business conversations, which are obviously much lengthier from, from the technical exploration to the launch last week, we were looking at a three to four months turnaround, which is obviously significantly faster because we really invested that, that 12 to 18 months in coming up with the foundation. Um, but it's, it's tough and, and you can't always assume that you're going to get quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. And then in the, in the final two, you're doing six weeks or something, because if you're doing it correctly, you should be learning and, and changing as you go and evolving as you go as well. Um, and sorry, I'm, I'm going on a little bit here, but I just keep thinking of loads of things about what you just mentioned. And, and, you know, one of the crucial things as well is getting that balance between rolling out a new product, um, you know, so taking something that you've built the foundation, localizing and doing that 20% of customization or whatever it is that's required to get it onto a new brand. But you can't neglect your base. You're going to need a stream. You're going to need some way, some sort of structure that allows you to maintain and continue developing the foundation and making sure these, and, and so I'm not sure everyone can see my hands, but they're, they're kind of dovetailing together because you need to make sure these things are connecting and talking. Because if you're continuing to evolve and innovate on your foundation and then you're off somewhere else rolling out to brands the brands that are way down the line are going to have a very different product to the one that's actually the one that you're proud of and investing in 
And so that's 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 really important. And, and I think some some um, teams make the mistake of kind of going, oh, we can just go off and do it and we'll get faster and faster and faster and we'll be a two week turnaround by the end. Or they, um, you know, or they just kind of don't connect the two the two aspects of the development and the rollout. Right, and I think that that opens up a really interesting question for Liz about how a team like hers works with a team like yours when there's ever-changing tech. We got a, a question um, in the Q&A box about Gutenberg, the blog, the, which we colloquially call Gutenberg, but the block-based editor that WordPress uh, came out with. Uh, how, as an example, about big changes that you then need to factor in to your, um, to your product conversation? Yeah, I mean, when I think about Penske Media Corporation and I think about Gutenberg and Nikki, please do feel free to interrupt at any time. But I always think about all the editorial staff that have to change their workflows. And every time we talk about Gutenberg, we think very specifically about that key stakeholder group and what that means to their day to day. And we're constantly kind of weighing, you know, the benefits to, um, you know, to the, the amount of time that it'll take an effort for uh, Penske to kind of implement something like that. So there's all these like little things that, that um, you know, when you have fewer stakeholders or uh, it doesn't impact, but when you're impacting editorial for Penske Media Corporation, you have to be so careful. So um, I know Penske Media Corporation has been working on rolling out Gutenberg and has had great success. And I know a lot of their engineers are very pro Gutenberg. And Nikki, how would you like to kind of tie that in? Because I see you unmuted. Yeah, sure. I mean, I was actually going to say, I mean, the fact that, that WordPress VIP recognize the impact on editorial is hugely important to us and, and particularly to me. I mean, it's very easy to get excited about new technology and we should, right? You know, this is exciting. This is going to be revolutionary for our, for our teams, for our editorial staff and for the way that they are able to get content out. However, it's also a huge change and change is scary. And when you're looking to implement that change across many different brands and not just editorial, but it also impacts you know, our, our business teams as well when we're looking at things like our ads and our SEO and our syndication and all those kind of things as well. So I think one of the most important things for us as a partnership is the very honest and frank communication. There is absolutely no point in either side being blind to what the other person, what the other side is is experiencing, or, or where they're coming from. You know, we know that WordPress VIP needs to get everyone onto Gutenberg eventually. You can't, they can't, you can't support continue supporting to editors. I mean, you can, but that's not going to be efficient. That's like us saying, yeah, we'll support multiple CMSs. But at the same time, so we, we know, we understand the drive, and we do believe in the value of of the new of the new admin interface. Um, but having the, the frank conversation of us being able to say, hey, this is going to be scary. We're going to have to take it slow at first. We're going to have to learn. Please bear with us. We'll keep you updated. And having those regular conversations is what, what's going to make this journey, you know, successful and actually really valuable for both sides. Because I'm sure, you know, we're going to learn things and, and going to go to, to, to WordPress VIP. You know, we've, we've, we've attended so many talks about Gutenberg rollout and learn about, you know, lessons other teams and companies have had. You know, we, we've spoken to, to, to partners like XWP. And at the same time, you know, the challenges that we face, we can feed back. So that when these guys are going out to other companies and other teams as well, that they can say, oh, actually, I know someone that tried that and that didn't work. Don't, don't do that. Don't phrase it that way or don't, you know, don't set up that that way. So it's all about being honest and frank, I think. Yeah, I should also say there's a couple of key things. Uh, circling back, Allison, to your earlier question regarding open source and VIP. Um, VIP published a ton of really great guides, probably back in 2017. Still relevant, a little old, but still relevant um, around how to update short codes, how to leverage uh, the APIs inside Gutenberg. So uh, the block-based editor isn't just this interface. It's also a new storage model. It's also these new APIs. You can use Gutenberg already in different ways. Um, it's all about collectively what you want to do with it. So some of the things um, that are I won't call them fully headless, but they're headless-like where you're leveraging REST APIs. The WordPress that uh, Rolling Stone is doing, these things are already leveraging Gutenberg. Um, and as you start to think about uh, rolling out Gutenberg in the wild, you might be considering only using for one post type or one section mm -hmm. of the site. Um, so there's a great plugin that's VIP built called Gutenberg Ramp that allows you to start to turn on uh, selectively how to use Gutenberg. Um, so it's scary to make a big change. Um, there's no absolute need to do it today or tomorrow or even this year. 
But so the earlier you do this, the, the more likely it is that you'll be able to start to do things like structured data on a per content type. Uh, the more likely it is that you'll be able to improve advanced SEO features, the more likely it is that your data will be cleaner. Um, but with something like PMC's entire network, we have really custom editorial workflow experiences that are built heavily on what's called the classic editor. The old Oh, I think uh -oh. we lost Leo. I know. In, the, in, the, in an impassioned moment. Well, <laughs> it does, it, it, the, 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 in the end, it really does sound like the, uh, the, the, factoring, in, oh. the factoring in experimentation and uh, that innovation combo between the two. Yeah, I think, um, and, and uh, sorry, Leo, you got, you got cut off a little bit halfway through there, but your point about doing it on a single post type is absolutely the approach we're taking. And actually what we're doing right now is we've developed it for a new feature as well. So it's not even a change. You know, it's actually, hey, you have wanted this thing. We can do this using this Gutenberg. This is great. Look at what we can do with it. And then you're going to start getting people excited about it and getting a subset of people excited about it. They will both spread the word, but they'll champion it as well. So when you come out to do more of the change management thing, you do that slowly. You're going to have champions within brands or within teams that are going to say, oh, I've actually been using that already for six months. I'll help you, which relieves some of the pressure on, on the products and engineering team to do all that handholding. So that, that is yeah the most valuable thing that I've learned over the last year about Gutenberg is, is that using the Gutenberg ramp and doing it on a post-type -like, post -like basis and, and trying things and experimenting. I would, I would also just say, like, I feel like it just in terms of barrier to entry, I think that adopting Gutenberg is so much easier than changing the way that people sign on, uh, like doing a single sign on and having to communicate that to editorial teams is a, a much larger um, change management process. Yeah. I, I would say greenfield development. If anyone is looking to build uh, a WordPress site today, I would definitely be considering Gutenberg as the first uh, way of building things. I would not be considering using the classic editor. I'd not be considering using any of the visual builders. Um, Gutenberg is the right way to do it. Uh, the challenge with PMC is that they have you know legacy brands, if you will. They, they, they're part of this portfolio that have been around for a really long time. Um, so they have a lot of content, a lot of things to change, and also a, an editorial team that has to consider what it, when is it right to be able to dive in and, and do this. Um, so it's all about slow transition. But if you're looking to build something Greenfield or you're moving from a CMS, say Drupal or uh, Sitecore or, you know, something else that's out big in the wild, you should be trying to move toward Gutenberg and avoid any of the, uh, the future tech debt that you might be uh, occurring. Man, I did not think the Gutenberg question would elicit this much from you guys. So thank you. Um, taking it back finally, just to uh, product approach. Um, and something, what we're hearing from you guys is agility is a word that gets thrown around a lot and you've said it, you haven't said it outright, which I appreciate because I think it's an overused word. We're talking about product, but at the same time, it's, you've been using other words to describe, uh, to describe agility. So I'm curious um, what it means to each of you when you're thinking about the future of Rolling Stone and its product roadmap. Nikki, let's start with you. Okay, um, sure. So, I mean, it is, it's, it's an overused word, but it's overused because it's just so important, um, you know, and kind of it harks back a little bit to what I was saying earlier about being proactive and, and reactive at the same time. And, you know, just some of the, some of the things that we kind of put in place, I've, I've mentioned a little bit already, but having the right structure to allow, you know, to allow the team to focus on things that are that the business believe are going to move the needle forward or at least want to try or, or we've seen success elsewhere um, but also allow us to be more reactive with with the industry with the world you know with things like covid you know that fundamentally has changed uh, a lot of a lot about publishing it's it's changed our events business massively so having the right structure in your team to be able to respond to those kind of things is is hugely important and Honestly, I think one of the, the big learning points or the big learning aspects that we've had over the years and, and we still have, you know, especially with brands like Rolling Stone is, is ask the right questions, you know, and that's, I know that's something that I think, you know, it's a huge, that's a huge um, mission of, of XWP when they, when they come and work with anyone new, they, 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 they pride themselves on asking the right questions and they are things like, why are we doing this? Do we need to do this right now? And that's very important for us with, with more of the reactive work. You know, if, if someone comes to us and says, okay, we've got this plan, we're 80% there, but stop because we need to work on something else. 
we were told the right as a team and particularly our leadership and our product leadership to stop back and say, okay, why? Talk to me about why I need to, to change this. And, and we have to always be challenging these things because otherwise you end up with a bunch of stuff that's 80% there and not delivered. And ultimately things do need to change. You do have to be reactive. You do have to be agile and all those kind of things, but you at least need to understand the importance of it. And I think the other thing as well as asking the right questions, which includes why are we doing this? You know, it's also things like, is another brand going to want this now? Or are they going to want it in two months time? If so, you know, how do we develop to account for that? Does it, should it be a PMC plugin? Should it go into Lava, our design system? And all of that kind of relates back to bringing our engineers in really early to the conversation as well. So it's very tempting to say, I'm not going to distract someone. I'm going to let them carry on with what they're focusing on right now and get on the road. And then towards the end, I'll, I'll bring them in when we're closer to working on it. But you might have been like 40% to coming up with a solution that actually isn't the right technical approach or, you know, makes no sense. Or there's other things that, you know, that our engineers want to talk to partners like XWP and, and, and WordPress V about to VIP to get some responses on. So we bring our engineers into the conversation early and we're asking those questions at that time to make sure that we are trying to get the right balance between keeping our focus, but being reactive and, and agile and making sure that we are, we're being more flexible with our roadmap than a, than a more traditional kind of model allows for. And honestly, it's just a lot of conversations. It's just a lot of stopping and going, okay, right. What, what do we do now? Okay, let's talk about it. And, and that's pretty much how we operate. So. Yeah, I, I think the, and, and Nikki, thank you for the kind words about XWP and our approach to product. Um, I get to feel really good about that for a second. The uh, the way that we approach things uh, is traditionally Agile Scrum. So we follow this by the book as closely as we can. Um, so we, most of our product owners go through some product owner training in the wild. So there's a bunch of great uh, cert certified Scrum product owner trainings, certified Scrum master trainings, depending on where and how deeply you want to go. Um, I think learning the process and sticking to it the right way is a really, really critical way to think about it. Um, my favorite uh, term that uh, people have started to adopt in the wild started with Brian Boyer, who's really famous in the product space. He's talked with the NPR uh, apps team. He calls it the minimum useful thing. So I asked this question, like, what do you really need? Um, why? Like, what, what do you, why do you want 15 more features? Like, do we only need two? Like, can we get away with two? Well, if we do two, we can be done in a month. If we do 15, we'll be done in six months. Um, so trying to get, you know, ultimately something completed as early as possible is critical. Um, I'd also say, uh, even though I've just said process matters, um, sometimes you want to be lean and be careful not to overbear those processes. Um, we sometimes use uh, the Kanban methodology at XWP because it's simpler and leaner uh, depending on the size of your team. Um, and of course, uh, as we work with you know, PNC and its giant organization and all these different stakeholders, um, we have to consider how we might block each other. So when you're talking about Agile, um, design is a really big factor, front end and back end being sort of separate are really big factors. Um, understanding that QA will ultimately block deployment, which is a good thing, um, these things are factors. So as you work through your different cycles, as you sort of plan out your entire project, you should be asking how and when will these things sequence up together and when something happens are you going to be arguing to change this are you going to be coming together to try to resolve this because sometimes you know the impasse is an important discussion to have you don't necessarily want to push something live and assume that the plan you started off with was the right one so uh, a big part of agility as you embody it in, in your team is really asking what do we really need and something comes up should i change it um, am i listening to all the key stakeholders internally and externally um, and of course uh, the other big thing that i think a lot of teams sometimes miss is they they put a lot of emphasis on, on a product manager or a product owner or a scrum master to worry about product. But when in practice at XWP, it might be an engineer or an architect, it might be a project manager, it might be VIP telling us something, right? Uh, it, might, it sometimes is a different stakeholder that's going to help shift that vision. And we need to understand why that's the case. So being as holistic as you can, as you think about what you want to build, um, is, is a really great way to think about it. Oh, I, I just I want to just chime in there and say thank you to both Penske Media Corporation and to um, XWP because we do come back. I mean, we are a, an extension of PMC's DevOps team and we monitor, we make some recommendations and those I know break all kinds of um, of workflows and sometimes we come in and we say hey just so you know this is not performing the way that, that you expected and we need to pivot and 
Um, sometimes, you know, we'll say, hey, this is something you need to think about in the next quarter. Sometimes it's, this is something you need to think about in the next six months. Sometimes it's something you need to think about now and uh, adjusting for those resources is really tough. And it's really great to be able to work with great partners who are making adjustments and allowing for kind of flexibilities and being agile enough to also know that you need to kind of continually maintain and manage your applications. I really like that phrase, agile enough. <laughs> I mean that's yeah. I mean I think that sums it up really. Yeah, I I, I want to put a, a a little like definition to that. The, I'll, I'll just be a little bit product oriented. So sometimes people will get really stuck up on what agile means, and then they'll read a sheet or they'll get a book and they'll say we have to follow this. It's like no. If you think about it, backlog grooming is identi basically throwing your ideas on, on a sheet. A sprint planning is basically deciding what you're doing over the next period of time. Uh, a demo and a retro is showing off what you just did. All of these key uh, scrums, if you will, are trying to show the world and specifically your internal and sometimes external stakeholders that you've done uh, something. So um, Agile is a framework to help you do better work and, and it also helps you write better software, helps you build better websites, helps you build better publishing uh, platforms, it helps you do just about anything. Um, and my favorite thing about working with PMC and VIP is that generally speaking, all these organizations embody Agile uh, methodologies in a way that's really easy to work with. And as you start to think about your organizations and the wild for the viewers listening in, uh, you should be asking the questions, how do I do what I do? Uh, and is this efficient enough based on what we know is true and what is available to us in the wild? Um, and and it's being agile enough to get through the, the hurdles of your day-to-day -day existence. I'm making you all t-shirts and sending you t-shirts that say agile enough on it. <laughs> I mean, that's my life this one definitely now. <laughs> uh, on that note, I think we're, we should end it there because that was really good. And um, I want to end on um, the big group hug that just happened. Uh, with that being said, I, I'm going to hand it back over to our media master, uh, Tess Needham. And uh, thank you all to our panelists. And thank you to all of our attendees. There were quite a few of you, so we hope you got a lot out of it. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much, Allison. And again, thank you to all of our panelists. And thank you, everybody, for attending as well and for your great questions. We had a few questions that we didn't get to answer, um, and they probably have quite longer answers than we had time for. So we're going to try to include those answers in a follow-up. Um, we'll also be sending out a recording to everybody. So I hope that um, the session was useful for you and thank you so much again for your time. Bye. Take care. Thank you.